G'day everyone, day 12, the PN Junction Diode. Um, previously I've spoken about talking more about uh, basic semiconductors like the bipolar junction transistor and how to use them. And I started writing out a whole bunch of um, material on the PN Junction Diode as, an, as sort of an entry into semiconductors. I don't want to do too much semiconductor physics or death by mathematics, but I think um, it's a basic introduction and understanding about the, the inherent nonlinearities in PN junction diodes and how that leads into the transistor is pretty natural. So let's start with junction diodes. Okay, so you see them normally drawn in a textbook like this. There's some slab of semiconductor material. One part is doped to be positively um, intrinsic. The other type you know, is N-type silicon. Normally silicon, although they normally talk about germanium from a historic perspective, but essentially it's a semiconductor. It either has an excess of holes or an excess of electrons in its lattice. So those semiconductors each individually would be more conductive than normal high purity silicon, which would be almost like a you know an insulator because it wouldn't have much. It depends on the temperature, obviously. Semiconductor physics is very complicated. And you should go read about it. But the basic idea is somehow magically you arrive at a slab of this material which one end is, has this excess of holes the other side has an excess of electrons and where they touch each other if the thing's sitting there on the bench not plugged into anything the holes and electrons will attract each other and neutralize each other in essentially in this region in the middle they'll recombine and there'll be some part of the the lattice in between the the two connections where it's essentially an insulator because there's no free charges, no, there's no free carriers to carry charge. When you apply a bias in the reverse direction, say you apply a negative, uh, a positive field here and a negative, you know, a voltage this way, it will pull, the positive charge will pull the electrons even further away from the depletion region or the intrinsic region, depending on, um, there's a difference, but anyway. And similarly for holes, if there's a negative charge here, the holes will be attracted away and will become a, even more of an insulator until you eventually give any charge that happens to be spontaneously generated in here enough energy to cause avalanche um, breakdown. But we're going to assume that you're, you're operating the diode within its, um, within its reverse breakdown voltage. Now when it's forward vo biased, the, you'll have a negative charge here and a positive charge here, so there'll be an electric field, you know, this way and electrons will be attracted by the positive charge and holes will be attracted by the negative charge and they'll they'll move into diffuse into the intrinsic region in the middle and they'll cancel each other basically or they'll recombine and that is a net current flow through the diode in this direction so that's basically how diodes work why they block current in one direction and why they allow current to flow in the other now, they're not actually really constructed like this, they're constructed something more like this, where you have a big slab of N silicon, or, or P silicon I suppose, but it's normally N for the, the, um, the main substrate. Then they have a P well diffused into it, they have an oxide layer grown on it, and they have metal contacts metallized on the, the top and bottom, and this is normally you know, diced up and stuck into something that looks you know, a whole lot like this, or even smaller. This is a 1N4148, which I made some measurements on, we'll see that in a minute. So the, the behavior of this is inherently nonlinear, and the Shockley diode equation describes this in, in general for all diodes, but there's a ideality factor here, so that there's this, the current through the diode is proportional to the voltage across, uh, the exponential of the voltage across the diode, essentially. There's this minus one term here, but that gets quite small as this gets large, because this, this is the thermal voltage, it's a function of temperature, and the charge of an electron and Boltzmann's constant, but at room temperature around 300 Kelvin, it is about 25.9 millivolts. It's a useful number to know, but the important thing to know is that this is very temperature dependent. But this saturation, reverse um, saturation current, is also extremely temperature dependent and is actually normally overpowers the thermal voltage in its importance. And you'll, in the case of a silicon diode, it actually changes the sign of the, the importance. But anyway, the, the most important thing is that this is not linear at all. And there's an exponential relationship between the voltage across the diode and the current through it. Basically, 
you know, most people think about diodes having 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts forward biased, and, and that's true, but it, it's true only for currents around what most people use them at. And what I did is I set up a circuit like this. I have a 12 volt power source, and I have a variable resistance here, a diode. I don't allow this resistance to get small enough such that the, the current through the diode is enough to destroy it, although I did accidentally do that once or twice, but we won't talk about that. Um, I measure the voltage across that diode with a multimeter. The multimeter has a, a finite input impedance, so as I make this resistance large, I need to compensate for that. I just did some um, case KVL at this VD node, so I can you know, basically put this into the computer and cancel out. I collected a whole bunch of data for RX from 10 ohms to 10 megs, so that gives you, uh, you know, current ranges from like you know, 10 to the minus 6 up to like an amp depending on whether or not the diode can stand it, and I did it for 1N4148s, 1N4007s, and also the base emitter junction of the 2N3904, which will I thought I'd do a transistor as well, because it sort of leads into when we start talking about Pipehola junction transistors. So, as you can see, as we go up in resistance by 10, the voltage drops by about 100 millivolts, approximately, for, for most of them. This ideality factor is obviously not, um, for, for example, for the 1N4148, you can actually solve this data and you'll get an answer around 1.7, which is about right for that diode, one, somewhere between 1.7 and 2 point something. Generally, it's between you know 1 and 2 for most common signal diodes, um, but it can be quite different, particularly for, for different device technologies. The, the perfect, you know, ideal semiconductor kind of diode, that would be Unity, but in most devices that you'll see in a minute, that's not entirely true, and it's normally around 1.5, 1.7, somewhere around there. Okay, so, this is the simple setup. I've just got a diode here. I used a um, decade resistance box because it was a convenient way to do it. It's got the multimeter across it and the power supply, which I've turned off because it's kind of noisy, but, you know, super simple lash up. You can do this experiment yourself. It's kind of handy to have one, in, you know, at least the tens decades of, of resistors hanging around so that you could do this just by plugging the resistors in or make yourself a decade box or buy yourself a decade box. Anyway, here's the end result of the... We've got current here and I made it log scale, so it goes from one microamp up to, well, one amp is the highest that I measured the one in four. 007 at. The other, um, the base emitter of the 2N3904 and the 1N4148 is rated to you know, about 100 milliamps, give or take. It's actually a little bit less than that. You can see the transistor is not as ideal of a diode as the diodes are, and the diodes themselves are a little wiggly. There's, as you get up into this region, um, temperature starts to be, the actual self heating of the diode starts to become an issue. So the as the temperature of the diode increases, the voltage will drop a little bit. And you can see that when you... Well, I'll show that actually to you in a second. The, um, at this other end, your recombination starts to become a problem. Um, so, anyway, it's, it's kind of complicated, but the main thing is it's pretty darn linear, log-linear of a relationship. If you drew it, obviously, it would just be... Uh, well, if this was linear, it would be exponential, and the graph wouldn't be particularly interesting. But the fact that you can linearize it by logging the current um, really shows you that you do have this exponential relationship because you end up with something that's vaguely linear. Okay, so that exponential you know, logarithmic relationship with current and voltage is super important when you start getting into bipolar junction transistors. And we'll probably talk about that next time because this video is probably going to go on for, uh, for quite a while anyway. Okay, let's fire up the power supply here. So I've set it to 12 volts, and you can see here, with the 1K resistor in, we're getting about 710 millivolts. My groany old power supply fan is the reason why I didn't want to have it on during the whole video. And if we, say, increase the, the current, this is a, um, a 1N4007, so it can take up to an amp. Let's, let's run it up a bit higher than that. So you can see the voltage increases, and I can even go up to almost a whole amp here. But you'll note that this is not stable and that voltage reading is actually dropping as the diode self heats. That again is the temperature dependence of diodes and one of the reasons why 
designing, I won't let that go on for too long, let's go back to around the milliamp. Well, one of the reasons why designing stable circuits with bipolar transistors is actually quite challenging because everything is essentially temperature dependent and the base emitter drop is one of the most important things in setting up a transistor circuit. Temperature dependence is something you have to work quite hard to compensate for. Alright, I think that's a, a pretty basic introduction to diodes. Um, the next episode, or maybe we might spread it out, I'll, uh, I'll talk more about the bipolar junction transistor now that we know about the, the basics of a single PN junction. Alrighty, until then, bye!